Some people think that uh, the character of Vincent and Old Bob were based on R2-D2, so the idea came along to make them float. The black hole began in February 1974 when two writers named Bob Barbash and Richard Landau came to Disney and pitched the idea to Frank Paris, who was an executive at Disney. Disaster films were a big deal at the time, and the two writers suggested they make a disaster film, but in space. The project was called Space Station One, and it was about a space station that would be populated with big movie stars that was hit by a supernova wave. The resulting impact of the phenomenon would cause a survival story where the citizens of the facility must escape the station before it falls apart. Paris liked the idea and involved other producers to give their opinion, like Ron Miller and Winston Hibbler. They all agreed it had potential. Within time, the studio decided to hire the two writers to make a story outline. They began writing, and during the process, producer Hibbler suggested they introduce a black hole into the story. By September 1974, they finished their outline, and Disney didn't seem to be in a hurry to greenlight the film, even though films like Earthquake and The Towering Inferno were big hits at the box office. You would think they would have rushed out the idea of Space Station 1 to cash in on the trend, but... Disney didn't. Thus, the first draft of the screenplay would be finished almost eight months later, in May 1975. The script would be called Probe One. Producer Winston Hibbler wasn't sold on the script, though. He hired a new writer, William Wood. He would finish rewriting the story by September 1975, but by then trends were changing in Hollywood, and the studio thought a disaster film in space would cost way too much money. With the film being shut down, Hibbler decided to retire, but he told the studio if they ever went back to the project, he'd come out of retirement for it. And that's exactly what happened in July 1976. Rather than do a rewrite, Hibbler suggested a visual approach. He hired concept artist Robert McCall to flesh out what the film would look like, and then they would go from there. McCall had worked on 2001 and NASA in the past, so there was not a better pick for the project. McCall made sketches of ships and robots. His visuals helped realize the possibilities, but most of all, his drawing of the Cygnus pretty much cemented the final concept of that ship. He also wanted the robots to be unique and came up with the idea of them floating and fairly agile. Remember, this was one year before Star Wars was on the big screens. From here, production began and everything looked great. John Hugh was selected to direct the film by Disney. Hugh had directed Orson Welles in Treasure Island, Peter Fonda in Dirty Mary Crazy Larry, and directly worked for Disney on Escape to Witch Mountain in 1975. Writer Arthur Long was brought in to rewrite the script, and during the process, Winston Hibbler would die in August 1976, and for a moment the studio was going to end the production, but decided to replace Hibbler with Ron Miller, who was one of the original producers who saw potential in Space Probe 1. When writer Arthur Long turned in his rewrite, dated October 1976, Miller was not happy with it. Disaster flicks were losing popularity. Another writer was brought on board named Ed Coffey. Disney, not impressed with the project, then changed gears. Since Hugh directed Escape to Witch Mountain, they wanted him to direct the sequel, Return to Witch Mountain, which planned to go into principal photography during the spring of 1977. So they pulled him off Space Station 1, and when he was done with Witch Mountain, he could return to the space disaster film. Nevertheless, Coffey continued rewriting the script, and on January 1977, he finished. But again, Miller wasn't pleased and wanted to change the entire vibe of the film. So in February 1977, he hired Jeb Rosebrook to do a rewrite. Miller gave the marching orders for his new writer to make something other than a disaster film and to put some emphasis on character building. He would do multiple rewrites, but Miller kept pushing for better. But after three years of investing in the project, Disney was tired of it. It was still basically at square one. So 
they put the project on hold, even though Rosenbrook was paid rewrites and he continued to do so to finish his contract. And that was seemingly the end of Space Station One. Star Wars changed Hollywood. Nothing had ever been seen like it, and was one of the biggest phenomenons in film history, especially with the kids of the 70s. Enviously, Disney eyed that project, wishing they had something like it. Currently, the only thing they had was Space Station One, and Jeb Rosebrook was already familiar with the project, so the production was revised, and Rosenbrook began writing an entirely new script. Frustrated, the project he was working on hasn't moved in a year and a half. Director John Hugh wanted to move on to other things. It was January 1978, and after finishing Return to Witch Mountain, his desire to return to Space Station One was not in the cards. He said goodbye to Disney in the project and worked for MGM in the star-studded Brass Target with Sophia Loren, George Kennedy, Robert Vaughn, and many others. Despite yet another hurdle slowing down the movie, Disney was now committed to making it, and quickly approached director Gary Nelson, who made Freaky Friday and The Boy Who Talked to Badgers for Disney in the past. Ron Miller approached Nelson for the project, which was touted to be the first PG film ever made by Disney. Miller wanted to expand the audience of Disney because most Disney fare was considered kitty material, and he wanted the black hole to expand that audience by not being G. Nelson frowned on the idea. It's not for me. I don't like it. It's not very good. But Miller asked him to at least look at the concepts, and Nelson met with then-production designer Peter Ellenshaw, who was also head of the mat department at Disney. I met with Peter, and he took me up to his office and showed me these incredible paintings that he had done for the movie, and I fell in love with them. And I said, well, shit, if this is what it's going to be like, count me in. Ellenshaw won the role of production designer because of his experience, and since this film needed groundbreaking effects, Disney pulled out the big guns. They even tried to rent the Dijkstra camera system from Star Wars for effects, but astronomical prices prevented them from using it. So Disney decided to get a team together and made an even more advanced system called the Aces, which would be used for complex scenes like the meteor rolling through the ship. It was then that Nelson dove into the final script by Jeb Rosebrook, which was finished in March 1978, and he honestly didn't like the script, which was called Space Probe 1 still. In this script, a space vessel gets trapped in the gravitational pull of a black hole, and they need to be rescued before it is completely destroyed. On this ship were families, and Nelson's gut reaction was honest. I thought, what is all this bullshit? So we threw all that out. While Nelson focused on the script, Ron Miller hired Mercury and Gemini astronaut Gordon Cooper to be a consultant on the production. Now that things were beginning to move forward, Gary Nelson hired a script doctor named Jerry Day to fix the script. By October 1978, these cleanups would mostly be finished and the new script was called The Black Hole. This script was more in line with what we saw in the finished film. A deep spaceship in 2130 called the Palomino finds a ghost ship called the Cygnus around a black hole. The film was more serious for adults with robots that could appeal to younger audiences. There was also a lot less characters to keep up with. There was even a romance subplot with Kate and Captain Holland. The crew board the Cygnus and discover what we later did. At the end of the script, it merely stated they go into the black hole and then something happens. Of course, no one liked that ending, but they figured they would come up to a satisfying idea idea as they went along. Disney was so enthusiastic about this film that they gave $3.2 million for set construction alone. Extensive miniature work and over 100 matte paintings were also made for the production. Early ideas for Dr. Reinhardt were Peter Cushing, Christopher Lee, and Donald Pleasance, but Maximilian Schell was most desired by Gary Nelson, who sought him out for the project. They sent the actor-director a script, and a meeting was scheduled. Nelson traveled to Vienna where Shell was directing Tales from Vienna Woods and Shell just didn't understand why Nelson wanted him for the part. 
report, he stated that he should look up Jason Robards, who had just appeared in an excellent television series called Washington Behind Closed Doors. I thought he was jerking me off. I said, yes, I not only saw it, I directed it, and his face was the most honest shock I've seen on a person. You couldn't direct him any better, and he grabbed me, threw his arms around me, and gave me a great big fucking kiss on the mouth and said, I will do your movie, and that was it. Shell said he would do the movie under the condition that he could have an editing room at Disney to cut his film when he was not on the set playing Reinhardt. The studio agreed, and the room was set up right next to Shell's fitting room. With Shell on board, it wasn't hard to cast Ernest Borgnine or Anthony Perkins. For the telepathic Kate McRae, Nelson suggested a then-unknown actress named Sigourney Weaver. The casting department turned down his idea quickly, stating, Oh my God, with a name like Sigourney Weaver, we don't want her. So they went with Jennifer O'Neill, who had been in many Italian and American films. O'Neill was known to have long hair, as she did a lot of hair commercials and such. Her hair was actually part of her brand. However, when they did tests on the zero gravity stuff, her hair was going to be a problem, as its movement would give away the camera tricks they would use. So, director Nelson had to approach her about the issue. This is not working. You have to cut your hair. And she said, oh, I can't do that. And I said, you're going to have to, because that's what I want. And it's right for the movie, too. And so, she finally agreed. And so, she brought in her personal hairstylist, Vidal Sassoon, to the studio. Since her hair was her staple in a way she decided to drink wine while they cut it at the studio every time they cut an inch she would drink a bit by the time they were finished she was a bit intoxicated then she did something really crazy and for some reason no one stopped her she got in her car to drive home and she got into an accident on sunset boulevard and ended up in the hospital because the film couldn't wait for her to recover they turned to yvette memu the following day yvette was in the 1960 films the time machine and where the boys are and was also well known for other movies and television appearances when it came time to cast the captain robert forrester was tapped my agent at the time called and said i've got a picture for you and it's the black hole and it was extraordinary 20,000 leagues out in space. Holy moly, it's some real big players in it. Ernest Borgnine was a big player. Maximilian Schell was big. Tony Perkins was big. And Yvette Mimu was certainly very well known. And here I am. I was probably 11 or 12 when I read the Jules Verne story. And when I realized that I was going to do the space version of that, wow. You know, there are moments when you're an actor and you get to play something extraordinary. And that was a big one. When the black hole came out, Forrester was in a career slump. He had been in films with Marlon Brando and Gregory Peck, but in the 70s, he kept his career alive by TV series, supporting roles, and low-budget films. He just couldn't get a break at the time, and Black Hole was a great moment for him. Forrester kept busy, but really never broke out of that slump, even though he would appear in memorable B-movies like 1980's Alligator and 1986's Delta Force. Forrester would continue in low-budget films through the 90s, but in 1997, he would show everyone what most fans of him already knew, and that was that he was a star, and a damn good one. And his role in Jackie Brown attests to that. I was also a fan of his appearance in Me, Myself, and Irene, which is a guilty pleasure of mine. He has always been a terribly underrated actor, and I thought I would take a moment to speak about that. Have you picked up your medication, Charlie? <laughs> Joseph Bottoms was an up-and-comer, and he just won a Golden Globe for New Star of the Year. He fit the right age and look of what Disney was looking for. Well, Black Hole is a love story between my character and a robot named Vincent. Not really, but... And he was called in where he sat with Gary and Ron to talk about the film. Oh, the fun of working on something I could share should I ever have children. I would have made a Disney movie, and it's science fiction. That's awesome. 
For the robot voices, Roddy McDowell and Slim Pickens were perfect choices. To prepare for the no-gravity scenes, Forrester, Bottoms, and Mimu went to a circus camp for about two weeks to work on their balance. Although their wire work would be hidden against painted backgrounds, they would later admit that their harnesses were very uncomfortable. Filming began on October 11th, 1978 on the Disney lot in Burbank. The film was to be 122 days scheduled with only four days off for holidays. A security guard was posted at all shooting locations and the only way in was with the proper credentials. The filming crew would work from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. for 26 weeks and Robert Forrester attested that there was never a variation to the schedule. Disney knows how to keep a schedule, and they made their picture, and it came in on time. Sometimes it would only be two or three shots in a day, something big. When we were approaching the event horizon of the black hole, and the ship was being torn apart, there were sometimes only one shot. We would prepare in the morning, and then rehearse it, and then come back in the afternoon and shoot it, and maybe shoot it only two or three times. In general, we shot a small, finite number of shots in a day. Because of the complexity of the film setups, it would often take hours, and as a result, there was a lot of waiting time on the sets. Anthony Perkins would often entertain cast and crew. Tony had the most wonderful stories of working with Hitchcock and he could imitate Hitchcock, his voice and mannerisms, and he'd just have us in the aisles laughing. For the cast, there was a shot-by-shot storyboard book for scenes so they could see what the vision was. The scenes were shot completely in order, as it would appear in the finished product. This would allow the filmmakers time to figure out what the ending of the movie was, and it also ensured secrecy. Because when the ending of the movie arrived, many in the cast would not know know what the ending was. In fact, Anthony Perkins stated that no one had a script that was complete, and only a few saw the script with the last 20 pages, and he was not one of them. Forrester stated he never knew the ending until he saw the final cut. Borgnine was referred to as an uncle or brother by Bottoms, as Borgnine was very kind and took an interest in everyone he worked with. If there was something to be done on the set, he was not the guy who would wait for somebody else to do it. If there was something that needed doing, he'd grab it and do it. He'd pick up a broom to push the refuse out of the way. He set an example for me. As the shoot came closer and closer to an end, the debate over the ending of the film continued. They mused if anyone would go into the black hole, but it was decided that it had to happen. But when it was decided that they would go in, there was always religious connotations applied to it. In the earliest ideas, after going through the black hole, the Sistine Chapel would appear with God touching the hand of Adam. They even went so far to get permission mission from the Vatican to have the painting appear in the film. Filming ended on April 20th, 1979, and the movie would cost $20 million to that point, which was huge for Disney. It was the most expensive movie the studio ever made up to that time. At the wrap party for the film, the attendees all wore costumes from the film to add extra fun. During post, Disney began touting the film early to garner build-up, and when they announced they were making the first PG movie that would be directed at older audiences, quotes like this touted a new future for Disney. Lately, a lot of teenagers and young adults have stayed away from Disney films. They consider it kiddie material. Well, The Black Hole is not a kiddie film. We want to let people know that this is a different kind of movie than they are used to seeing from us. We're making this one for the adults. And Gary Nelson would say this. At first, we didn't know exactly what would make it PG. So we decided that we would say that it was too intense for younger audiences. Plus, Dams and Hells never appeared in Disney films until The Black Hole. Do-gooders outside the company began writing hate mail to the studio protesting the movie. Even stockholders threatened action against the company, but producer Ron Miller stood his ground and simply asked for people to see the movie before passing judgment. With their 
their own channel, Disney promoted the film hard during the fall of 1979, and they even aired a special show dedicated to the movie on December 16, 1979, on their wonderful World of Disney series in an episode called Major Effects. The show had Joseph Bottoms dressed in a ridiculous outfit, going over how special effects, costumes, and makeup work in films. The show would have musical numbers and skits. However, there would only be five minutes of the show dedicated to the black hole, despite advertising it as a major topic covered in the episode. You can see this show easily on YouTube. Disney would eventually spend six million to market this film. And with all that money spent came the merchandising, which we will cover at the beginning of the next episode. That wraps it up for this one, and we'll see you in the next episode. Don't worry, Mr. Pizer. They also serve who only stand and wait. Vincent, were you programmed to bug me? No, sir, to educate you. If you like what you see here, click like and subscribe. Super thanks helps, but sharing helps the most. We really appreciate your time.